What we are currently experiencing is the brain death of NATO. You have no coordination whatsoever of strategic decision-making between the United States and its NATO allies, none. Emmanuel Macron, President of France, speaking to The Economist. North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in short, NATO, was born on the 4th of April, 1949, following the execution of the North Atlantic Treaty between the United States and several European countries. NATO, sometimes referred as the North Atlantic Alliance, was founded by United States, France, United Kingdom, Benelux countries, Canada, Portugal, Italy, Norway, Denmark and Iceland. Those 12 countries have accepted, from time to time, other European countries, extending membership to a total of 30 countries. The intent of NATO was merely military, and the Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty is what we could call the core business of the organization. Quote, the parties agree that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all. So, which country could have been so stupid to attack a member of NATO knowing that such a devastating combined firepower would have retaliated? The answer is simple. Nobody. If you thought about the Soviet Union, you're wrong. Moscow would have never been so stupid to endanger its economy and its whole existence to fight NATO. However, the Soviet Union would certainly have been an aggressor without NATO. As a result, we are fully confident to state that NATO served its purpose very well, guaranteeing peace between the two superpowers and their respective blocs for more than four decades. Proxy wars and moments of tension were inevitable. But when we had those two super-dominant countries in the room together, Korean War, Cuba Missile Crisis, Vietnam War and other historic events, but still nothing comparable to a nuclear war or a mutual assured destruction scenario. It's also telling that Article 5 has only been triggered once in the entire NATO history. And it was in the aftermath of the World Trade Center attack in 2001, when the United States, invoking Article 5, informed the other NATO members to be ready for retaliation. Once again, Russia was not the culprit. We can affirm that NATO has been passive for the entire length of the Cold War between United States and the Soviet Union. No military intervention occurred from 1949 to 1991. Starting from 1992, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the disaggregation of its territory into several independent states, NATO lost its purpose and it has been used in many other ways than the one that it was created for, except in 2001 in connection with the September the 11th attack. The very first operation put in place by NATO was dated 1994 in Serbia, when American F-16s acting under the NATO command shot down Serb fighters in the Yugoslav sky. According to many historians, this was the very first time NATO used brute force. And the singularity of this event is that NATO took this action that was not compliant with its own treaty. No member state had been attacked or was about to be attacked as provided by Article 5. To avoid any misunderstanding, we're not taking a political position or taking any sides here. We merely describe facts as they took place based on documents. We also need to explain that NATO was not acting as a fully independent organization. On the contrary, NATO forces were coordinated by the United Nations in order to contain the violation of human rights perpetrated by the Serbian army against other ethnic groups. A further NATO intervention occurred in 1999 against the Yugoslav army during the Kosovo War. However, this time, the military intervention did not happen under the United Nations umbrella, in clear violation of the international laws and treaties. Not to mention that both Yugoslavia and Albania had no relationship whatsoever with NATO in 1999, and certainly no possibility to trigger Article 5. Albania became a member state of NATO only in 2009. As we've mentioned, Article 5 has only been triggered once in the history of NATO. A few weeks later, the September 11 attacks in New York and Washington, President George W. Bush correctly asked the NATO members 
to conduct operations against terrorist organizations connected to the Twin Towers terrorist attack. Several operations have been conducted by NATO in response to this horrible attack, which had civilians as main targets on American territory. In this occasion, NATO had shown strong unity, supported militarily and logistically also by many other countries, which were not member states of NATO. After 52 years from inception, NATO had shown the world why it existed. A few years later, NATO was acting out of its scope in controversial operations, such as anti-piracy patrolling and engaging tasks in the Gulf of Eden, and in 2011 in Libya, where the Allied Armed Forces overthrew the former dictator Muammar Gaddafi. These out-of-scope interventions, considered controversial and in breach of several international treaties by many geopolitical and military commentators, as well as international lawyers, dented the popularity of the alliance with other countries and fermented tension amongst the member states. The words of President Macron we used to open this video may be too harsh and inadequate for a newspaper interview, but certainly they give the state of mind of one of the founders of NATO about the situation within the alliance. Among several other examples, another incident has happened recently with Turkey, when President Erdogan has concluded the purchase of military weapons from Russia, notwithstanding Turkey being a member of NATO. This course of action has seriously irritated the other member states of NATO, since it is a clear breach of a tacit agreement within the alliance. We believe that the main issue why NATO has overstepped its original scope is because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Without such a significant enemy, and without the communist ideology threatening Europe, the current role of NATO is rather limited, redundant, and extremely costly. Moreover, despite Russia still being considered a military powerhouse and active in minor regional conflicts such as Georgia and Ukraine, Moscow lacks the economic strength to be a true antagonist of NATO. It seems that the operations undertaken by President Putin were more aimed at consolidating votes in Russia and its chair at the Kremlin rather than flexing its muscles in view of an imminent invasion of Europe. We should not forget that NATO is a powerful military organization which comprises 30 nations. Those nations produce more than 50% of the world's gross domestic product and have more than 3 million troops on duty in aggregate. NATO operates massive combined naval fleets supported by the best air forces with a total dominance of seas and skies globally. In terms of military expense, NATO can rely on a budget in excess of 1 trillion US dollars, which is four times what Russia and China combined spend yearly. In addition, we should also take into consideration that several countries which used to be part of the Soviet Union bloc are nowadays members of NATO. Therefore, if the Soviet Union were not interested in a direct confrontation with the West, how could Russia, with an economy crippled by sanctions and a deep technological gap, be a credible enemy for NATO. Another proof of how intimidating NATO still is, is the new method of hostile engagement of Russia towards NATO member states. In reality, the ongoing conflict between Western countries and Russia does not take place inside tanks or submarines, but behind a computer. Russia has massively increased its cyber warfare capabilities and is particularly strong in social manipulation and other cyber attacks in other countries without early detection. And here it comes, the first of our observations in relation to the current status of NATO and its purpose. Why does NATO not extend its military firepower also in this new field? Is NATO starting to be an obsolete organization? Despite establishing the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in 2008, Several commentators have criticized the real cyber warfare capabilities of NATO. In a 2019 interview to the US magazine Time, Admiral James Stavridis, retired, former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, has implicitly confirmed that the cyber warfare abilities of NATO are not up to its ordinary warfare skills and, quote, the Alliance should up its game in cybersecurity, both defensively and in the collective development of new offensive cyber tools. 
Despite many observers not agreeing with our vision, we strongly believe that Russia does not represent a military threat to any country that's part of NATO, including the Baltic Republics and the newly formed Balkan states. President Putin is well aware that the lack of unity within the European Union and NATO is the biggest threat to their respective existence. A wrong move by Russia and the perception that the EU or NATO must confront an external enemy will immediately reunite their respective members. Therefore, we deem that Russia will continue to play its role behind the curtains, or better, behind a computer, which so far has proven to be far more effective tool than missiles and rifles. Moreover, Russia can rely on the fact that there is no other alternative to the United States. And as soon as a government is unhappy about the political agenda of the European Union or NATO, the US will knock on Russia's door. As we mentioned, NATO served marvelously its purpose during the Cold War. And to some extent, it is still playing a fundamental role in the Western side of the world. Don't get us wrong, we truly believe in NATO and we fully appreciate its contribution to peace from the Second World War until today. However, it seems that NATO needs a full reorganization in terms of cyber warfare, global repositioning and reconsideration of new member states. The challenges that nowadays NATO may face to maintain peace and the values of its such as freedom and democracy are different than what they used to be 60 years ago when NATO was founded. In order to find the upcoming rival of NATO, we believe that we need to travel further east to China. First of all, we want to explain why, in our opinion, China will be the future antagonist of NATO and, in general, of Western countries. The fast rise of China over the last 30 years is an event that nobody has ever witnessed in the entire history of the world. We're used to economic miracles of Western countries after the Second World War when the reconstruction of the countries happened rather quickly, boosting economies. Also, Singapore and Qatar represent economic masterpieces, as well as Japan and, more recently, South Korea. But China is a whole different story with a very different magnitude. China is a giant who woke up willing to project influence and power worldwide. With a yearly growth in excess of 10% over the last 30 years, China has become by far the largest economy in the world, calculated on a purchasing power parity basis. Since the first wave of reforms initiated by Deng Xiaoping, China has commenced an incredible path of transformation. From a rural economy oppressed by the rigid rules of the communist ideology, to an advanced economic system often referred to as state capitalism. Unlike free market economies, in China, a majority of the production and use of capital is in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. In other words, a large part of the economy is represented by state-owned enterprises, such as banks and financial institutions, telecommunication companies, utility conglomerates, and so on. In 2003, China began investing in natural resources in Africa, with a total investment on the Black Continent equal to just less than $1 billion. Those numbers increased steadily up to 2016, when, for the first time, investments from China to Africa overtook the investments of the US and European Union countries combined. We wanted to mention this example of Chinese direct investment in Africa to give you an idea of how eager and strong China is financially. Now we can go back to NATO's future challenges. One of the peculiarities of a modern army is the availability of modern and advanced technologies. And the United States understood this aspect before anyone else. The US Army was already surfing on the internet in the 1970s. And that was when Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were still in their own garages planning to change our lives forever, not knowing that someone else in the Pentagon was already mentioning the words email and internet protocol. Unlike Russia, which has never given the impression to be ahead of this technological race in the 70s and 80s, China understood already the importance of advanced technologies and their applications in the military industry. Even though NATO maintains a strong technological gap with the rest of the world, including China, 
several reports and commentators started to be worried of how fast China is catching up with Western countries. Huawei is just one of many examples we can bring to your attention. Founded in 1987 by a former People's Liberation Army official and engineer as a repair shop for service switches in Shenzhen, Huawei managed to become a leading telecommunications company within 30 years, manufacturing top quality devices, including latest generation mobile phones and 5G microwave antennas. We may dedicate a separate video to the boycotting campaign against Huawei worldwide. What we are interested in sharing with you is the fact that Huawei has technologically overtaken European and American multinationals, such as Nokia Siemens, Cisco and Ericsson, in a sophisticated industry like telecoms. This is one of the reasons why Huawei is boycotted by certain member states of NATO. And if China is capable in such a short time to overtake Western technology in telecommunications, this may happen in other lines of businesses, such as the defence industry. As we all know, ideas without financial support to implement research and development programmes are just not enough. China is aware of this, and the defence budget has steadily increased over the years. Despite the total amount allocated for defence has always been in the range of 1.2 to 1.7% of gross domestic product, the Chinese economy has grown exponentially, and so proportionally has the defence budget. As a result, in 2010, China was spending less than $100 billion in defence and weapons. In 2020, this amount has risen to $250 billion, which is still far from what NATO combined spend yearly. However, let's re-evaluate these expenditure figures of the purchasing power parity and we get a very different story. If we deduct the costs of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the budget for defence of the United States and China are not that far apart. This is also one of the reasons why President Trump has expressed disappointment in 2016 at a NATO summit complaining that not all member states have paid their 2% of GDP contribution to NATO. You may disagree on President Trump's tone and manners with his allies, but staying ahead of defence expenditure is crucial for NATO. China has also undertaken an expansion plan of military bases globally. Today's main focus is to convert small islands in Asia into landing strips and harbours for its fighters and fleets. This task has been achieved showing an unprecedented aggressiveness against other Asian countries such as Japan, the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam and Indonesia. In addition, China is actively building relationships with other countries in order to lease lands in strategic places to project its military power globally. The first base has been already built in Djibouti and China is in negotiations with other countries to secure more army bases worldwide. Now that we've identified where the major threat to the Western world may come from, we should consider how NATO should be restructured. We seriously believe that a further expansion of new member states in Asia may be required to contain China on its doorstep. Despite the name North Atlantic Treaty Organization, it seems clear that the world has changed since 1949 when NATO was founded, and the Atlantic Ocean seems much more peaceful than the Pacific Ocean nowadays. As a result, we believe that long-term allies of NATO should be part of the organization itself. Australia and New Zealand without doubt, as well as South Korea, Thailand and Vietnam. Unfortunately, Japan has restricted provisions in the constitution which do not allow to reorganise its army for offensive purposes. As such, other member states may argue about the need to have an ally which does not fully fulfil its offensive role. Another potential member state which had recent issues with China is India. That would be a terrific asset for NATO in terms of geographical position and number of troops. Looking at the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, despite selling 45% of its oil to China, could be a valid new member state of NATO and could reduce the reliance on Turkey. Also, we want to emphasize that being part of NATO doesn't mean you do not do business with China. Germany and German companies, for instance, has extensively invested in China 
notwithstanding it is a member state of NATO. A full rebalancing of NATO in the Pacific Ocean region will create the same scenario of the Cold War, where any potential aggressor would be outnumbered in terms of nature and magnitude of a response, suffocating any threat or hostile manoeuvre. In light of the fact that China could, in the future, be much more powerful than what the Soviet Union was in the 1970s and 80s, we believe that a strong reorganization of NATO is required sooner rather than later to contain the Chinese influence and aggressiveness. What plays in favor of NATO is China's habit of ruining long-term relationships with other countries. If they can initially get along due to investments and capital injections from China, in the long term, several countries realize that getting too close to China was a mistake. Amongst others, Australia seems to be paying heavy consequences. In this regard, we recommend watching our video about this topic. The link is in the description under Australia-China relationship. To conclude, the ancient Latin motto, if you want peace, prepare for war, seems to be handy in these modern times. And once again, NATO should take it into serious consideration in order to be ready and prepared to face the new challenges coming from the Pacific Ocean. We thank you for your attention and we do hope you enjoyed this mini-series. Please do let us know your views on this topic by commenting below. Also, please feel free to like, subscribe and don't forget to turn on your alerts. We'll see you soon.